All right. Striving is something we all understand to some extent, don't we? It almost sums up the human existence. You know, I remember my kids, and many of you would, when they're first starting to learn how to walk and they hold themselves up on a piece of furniture and they kind of shuffle around the furniture and there's a sense of they're, they're striving and then they let go and they kind of sit there and they wobble. And we all go through that experience from the day we're born. Striving at school, well, some people strove at school, um, striving to win the affections of a boy or girl, striving to get your first car, striving to get your first house, striving to get ahead financially, striving to care appropriately for your kids, striving to save for retirement. The reality is, from the day we're born, we sort of begin this process of striving. And one of the conditions, one of the consequences of the fall, the curse on Adam and his descendants, was that by the sweat of his brow, by striving, you would eat of the land. In other words, you were going to have to work hard because of the fall. You were going to have to strive and give it all you've got because even the land itself was going to fight you because sin and the consequence of sin not only affected Adam and Eve, but affected all of creation. And so we live in a fallen world and we must strive every day of our life to get through it. The problem with this is it has two impacts, or one of two impacts on the human nature. It tends to result in either pride or shame. You'll meet the man who tells you that he is a self-made man, that he has striven above and beyond long hours. Everything I have, I have earned by the sweat of my brow. In the words of Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. And people look up to that man. Have you met so-and-so? He did it all himself. Right? There's a pride that comes from having conquered. But you know, you'll also meet the stay-at-home mum, working incredibly hard to raise up children who are godly and respectful, but who's afraid to spend a cent because she doesn't feel like she's earned it and feels slightly ashamed that she hasn't actually earned the money that's coming into the house. Both pride and shame are the consequence of this kind of focus of striving. All of this impacts every one of our hearts in one way or another, and it has certainly impacted all of the religions that you will find in the world. In all of them, you must strive to please a god or gods to improve your lot. Whether it's Islam and a desperate attempt to earn Allah's favor, favor, which by the way, Muhammad said he didn't know whether or not he was saved. If Muhammad, their key prophet, didn't know if he made it, then it's truth, what hope have the rest of them got, right? So you've got to strive as best you can, or maybe it's Buddhism and, and trying to reach nirvana, or Hinduism with karma and reincarnation, but whatever it is, you are striving as best you possibly can, trying to reach the next step, the next rung, all based around human exertion, human effort, human will, all trying to get a blessing rather than punishment. Every religion on the planet. And you know what? The reason a lot of these religions are so popular in the world is because we're largely comfortable with this. See, life is striving. We're used to striving. It's part of our existence from the day we are born, trying to improve our lives, trying to make things better for ourselves. And so along comes a belief that life after death is so dependent on my own actions, it kindly fit, 
fits in with who we are. And we all have a remarkable ability when we assess our life, we tend to assess our life as being slightly better than the next person's anyway, so we feel on the striving scale that we actually are going to do okay. Because we are usually just that little bit better than the person we look down on who probably is our neighbour. I set the scene to say, this is our friend Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a representative of all religious people. And we looked at his conversation with Jesus last week. Nicodemus would have been a man confident in his striving, in his religion, sure that he was better than most. But something Jesus said left him completely undone. Something Jesus said left him completely undone. You see, Jesus confronted him with grace. You must be born again, born of the Spirit, born again as a child of God. And the problem with this for most people is that it's God's act. You can't make it happen. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. And you can't assess yourself as better than the next person if you have come to faith via grace. As Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, grace puts its hand on the boasting mouth and shuts it once for all. Right? Grace puts its hand on the boasting mouth and shuts it once for all. And I might add, it puts its hand on the shameful heart, the embarrassed mind, and removes their stain forever because grace removes human exertion. The reality is, why am I here this morning as a child of God? And it's because Jesus paid the penalty of my sin, called me his own, welcomed me into his family, gave me his righteous and eternal life forevermore by his will and act. So am I any better than the person out there who doesn't know Christ? Absolutely not. Jesus has saved me. I have no boast other than Christ. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you have no boast other than Christ. The boasting mouth is shut forever apart from giving glory to Jesus. Amen? All right? That is what Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus. And this wrestle of grace is what's going to go down with Nicodemus. And it happens to many people to cease striving. This whole concept that we've grown up with and rest in amazing grace is a battle against the pride and shame of the human condition. Right? To rest in the grace of Jesus. So let's continue our passage and see how this unfolds. So we're up to John 3. We're going to work through to 9 to 21 this morning, but I'm just going to initially read 9 to 15. John 3, 9 to 15. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and yet you do not believe, if I tell you, um, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Note the reaction from Nicodemus. How can these things be? 
See, he was well-versed in striving after God. He knew the rituals. He knew the self-denial. He knew the repentance. He knew what it was to try and earn God's favor. But now Jesus comes along and says, you must be born again outside of your control, Nicodemus, outside of your ability to strive. And Nicodemus just can't see how this is possible. And his response must have been one of total disbelief and absolute rejection of what Jesus had just presented because Jesus responds here with a pretty harsh rebuke. It comes across very strongly. Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Note it says, are you the teacher of Israel? Now this denotes that Nicodemus was probably recognized as a teacher of teachers. Are you the teacher of Israel? A master in his field, Dr. Reverend Dr. Nicodemus, right? So it's a, it's a big, heavy title here. Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? That is a solid rebuke to someone who has that kind of status, is it not? right? You're the teacher of teachers, and you don't get it. The question is, why? Why should Nicodemus have understood what Jesus was saying? And the thing is, it's not new what Jesus is saying, because Nicodemus was a scholar of the Old Testament, and these truths exist in the Old Testament. Just quickly, this is Jeremiah 31, 33. Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law with them, within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. By the way, whose action is all of that? Did you know? God's. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. The end of human exertion, the act of God to save. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. Listen again. Whose action? And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And here it is in the Old Testament. I will do it. I will change your heart. I will give you my spirit. And I will cause you to walk in obedience. Why? Because you now have a heart of flesh. You have a heart that's open to the things of God, which lovingly and willingly submits itself to God. By whose work? By whose effort? By God's. The end of striving. When God himself does the work in your heart, to bring you to himself. It was right there. And yet the Pharisees, Nicodemus, they had missed it by human effort, by human exertion, by human will. They were striving to try and earn God's favor. And here Jesus says the time has come when God gives you his favor. Now you may have noticed, it sounds a little odd, then Jesus Jesus moves to the collective we. We speak of what we know, witness to what we have seen. Now, I think you can read endless commentaries on this. I think it's purely a rhetorical device, to be honest, everything I've read. So Nicodemus, if you go back to uh, the start of this conversation in verse 2, Nicodemus says, we know that you are a teacher. And he's referring to the leaders of Israel. We know that you are a teacher. And so Jesus here responds effectively by saying, Well, we know. So it's just kind of coming, I think it's a rhetorical device, right? So literally I've read all of the arguments and I think that's what it is. Jesus responds with effectively saying, what you all collectively think you know, we know for sure. Why? Because we are actual witnesses. Jesus here is claiming authority above and beyond that of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council over Israel. He's claiming to know firsthand the truth about getting to heaven. 
And Jesus says, if I told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I then tell you about heavenly things? So what is the earthly things he's speaking about there? Now this is going to sound a little odd maybe. I think the earthly things he's speaking about there is being born again. Now, would you sort of say being born again is an earthly thing? Well, it happens on earth, doesn't it? In the context of our passage, Jesus is just explaining to Nicodemus how you are to be saved. And what he says is, you must be born again. And we experience this whole being born again into the kingdom of God here on earth. And seemingly, I think what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is, I've explained to you the beginning point. I've explained to you where a relationship with God starts. It is to be born again. It is to bend your knee, die to this world and its desires, put your faith and trust in Christ as your saviour for eternal life. That's the beginning point. Nicodemus, there's no point in us going on to have a discussion about the end times. There's no point in us going on to have a discussion about any of these things unless you embrace the start. You need to be born again. Right? So that's, I think, what Jesus is saying. Nicodemus, it begins right here. You need to be born again. It happens here on earth. It happens when you submit your life to Christ. It's a basic principle for every Christian. You must be born again. Church, this is why the Bible goes on to say, avoid those who just live for theological controversies. If you've ever met people... Some of the big ones, it could be creation, it could be their view of the end times, A-mill, pre-mill, post-mill, uh, it could be any of these things, but they actually care more about that than they do the gospel. All they want to talk to you about is this one narrow facet of theology. And I would suggest to them that Jesus would say, look, you need to come back to the start. The good news that there is salvation in Jesus Christ. That is of first importance. Dwell there, live there, proclaim that to your friends and to your family. And then sometimes when you happen to have a good coffee nearby, sit down with someone and argue about those other things for sure. Enjoy yourself. But the center point is coming back to the gospel, right? That's where it must begin and that's where we honor and serve Christ from. Nicodemus, you must deal with the critical issue, are you born again. Jesus then gives his reason for his authority and the fact is that he is from heaven. Jesus knows all of these things to be true because he is from above. And then Jesus links himself back to the book of Numbers when a plague of snakes struck the Israelites and Moses made a bronze serpent and lifted it up so that whoever looked at it would be saved. Now we looked at this when we did the overview of the book of Numbers. So we did a year last year of doing an overview of every Old Testament book. So if you want to check that out, just get online and you can look up the Numbers overview. But the serpent represents the devil and our sin. So why would Moses lift up a serpent for salvation? Well, of course, he's not lifting up the serpent for salvation. It foreshadows that one day our sin would be lifted up on the cross. Right? That's what he's saying, that Jesus on the cross would carry our sin and sin and death and Satan would be defeated on the cross. As Christ said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Right? It's a foreshadowing of the life in, that we have through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the context of our passage is of man striving to reach God. And here Jesus begins to explain that God has actually reached down to us. Right? That is the critical context of this passage of Scripture. And all of that has led to probably the most famous verse in the entirety of the Bible. A verse so familiar to billions, and yet shocking in its simplicity and power. 
John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, it's almost a shame that we're so so familiar with this verse because we miss the incredible, amazing audacity of this verse. In a world of striving, in a world of trying to better oneself, trying to achieve whatever it might be, a world full of religions that are all based on human effort, along comes this verse, says, no, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. He chose Jesus to die in your place. He gives you life when you put your belief in him. Mind blown. The eternal God, the I am, the maker, creator, sustainer of all things, the alpha and omega, the first and the last, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent king of kings and lord of lords so loved you that he sent his son to die for you. That he would dwell in the filth of this world, that he would live a perfect life And he would willingly take your sin upon himself to die on the cross, bearing the wrath of the Father at your sin so that you can have life in his name. The end of striving. Grace upon grace upon grace. That is the incredible truth of what this passage is teaching, church. That should should bring you to tears every time you hear it. That God so loved you that he sent his son to pay your penalty. That you can have life in his name. This is what separates Christianity from everything else because it's not about your effort or your striving. It's about what Jesus has done to give you life. The rest of our passage in full. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does What is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Here is the truth. You can be saved, born again, not by human striving, but by the will of God. You can be free from sin and have eternal life because Jesus loved you and gave himself up for you. I want to read to you the words of the great reformer, Martin Luther. Now, we're going back in time here to the early 1500s, so the language is kind of a bit older. Um, Plus, it was written in German, so you've got to translate that as well. But what Martin Luther understood at the time was religion. He understood that you had to strive in order to win God's favor that it was by your effort and your will you might get to heaven. And in Martin Luther's own words, he basically says that he was devoted to the God he hated. Devoted to the God he hated. Why? Well, in his words. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, 
Yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners eternally lost through original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Decalogue without having God add pain to pain by the gospel and also by the gospel threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Did you get it? This was a man who had memorized the entirety of the New Testament, every verse of it. He was on his way to memorizing the entirety of the Old Testament as well. He was 100% dedicated to striving after God, 100% dedicated to trying to please God by human will and human exertion. But here's what Martin Luther understood. God is perfect in holiness and righteousness. Any sin is enough to condemn you before the holy and righteous God. And Luther knew that no matter how much he strived, no matter how hard he worked, that he stood condemned against the holy God. Is it any wonder he hated the God that he devoted himself to? No matter how hard he tried, it just revealed more and more of God's holiness and his sinfulness, right? This is what Martin Luther went through in his journey after God. And then he wrote this. Thereupon I ran through the scriptures from memory. I also found in other terms an analogy as the work of God, that is what God does in us the power of God with which he makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. And as I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I before had hated the word righteousness of God. Thus that place in Paul was for me the gate to paradise. What was it? That he understood the righteousness of God was given by God and not his own works and striving. As he understood that the righteousness of God was a gift from God, not earned, not achieved, but freely given through the death and resurrection of Jesus, in his own words, this was for me truly the gate to paradise. Right? The gate to the grace of God. The gate by which we know that our righteousness is given, credited to us by the work of God. Christ. This is the truth of John 3.16. This is the good news of the gospel. If you would but let go of pride and let go of shame and make your only boast Jesus, how sweet is the salvation that is freely given in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our passage goes on to say that Jesus came into the world to save it rather than condemn it. Now, the world here means the fallen world, the sinful world. And it says he will save those who believe and condemn those who do not. But he will save those who put their faith in his death and resurrection. Why don't people accept the free gift of salvation? Well, John takes us back to chapter 1, doesn't he? Because they love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Those who are caught up with and in love with the things of this world cannot abide the light of Christ for it burns in holy purity against the desires of this world. And we would rather have the pride of this world or we'd even rather walk in the shame of this world. We don't like to come into the holy light of Christ where everything is given by grace. And yet the only way of salvation is to surrender ourselves freely to the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
I've read this once before and I'm going to read it again because it is just the most perfect image. I'm just going to read to you this little bit of C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It is such a powerful uh, passage. If you're familiar with it or if you're not, Eustace is a self-centered, self-focused, awful character. Everyone, anyone familiar with Voyage of the Dawn Treader? Oh, Eust- I mean, if you're about to call your son Eustace, you wouldn't after it, right? He's the most annoying, whinging, stuck-up character. And guess what? Eustace is meant to represent all of us. He is a person who is living out his sin nature. That's what he is in the book, right? So Eustace is living out what it looks like to be sinful. And through greed, he ends up stealing the treasure of a dragon... And he puts on this like bracelet and it gives us this beautiful image of a full-blown sin nature and what that looks like because Eustace in fact turns into a dragon. He's scaled, he's ugly, he is meant to be a picture of the sin nature when it's full-blown. When you give yourself over to sin and its desires, it becomes something ugly. And he wrestles with it. He hates it. He knows that it's kind of condemning him. He knows that he's trapped by it. And in the words of the book, he begins to try to deal with it himself. But no matter how often he tries to stop being a dragon, he is unable to break free of his sin nature. It's all a striving and it gets him nowhere. It is your condition. It is mine. It is the way we're all born slaves to sin and we simply cannot change our natural human condition. But then he has this conversation with Aslan and Aslan, as most of you know, represents Jesus. He is a massive lion in the story and the lion represents Christ and this is the conversation. Then the lion, Aslan said, but I don't know if it spoke You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now, so I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, It hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. You see, to come into the light, to believe in Jesus means subjecting yourself to the lion's claw, to the holy radiance of God. It is painful to come into the light of Christ and see who you really are. We're so good at lies to ourselves. We're so good at judging ourselves better than we are. We're so good at making up stories and justifying ourselves against our friends and neighbors. But when you come into the light of Christ, he reveals yourself as you really are a terrible sinner condemned by a holy God. But the sweet relief, when you're stripped of your sin by the work of Christ and given a new life, born again in his name. The story goes on. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked the scab off a sore place, it hurts like bilio, but it is such fun to see it coming away. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off. And there I was, as smooth and soft as a peeled switch and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that very much because I was tender underneath now that I had no skin, uh, that I'd not had the dragon's skin on. And he threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. As soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm, and then I saw why I'd turned into a boy again. See, he felt the pain of rebirth, and then the water that Aslan threw him into represented being baptized. He was 
born again and baptized into Jesus. But I love how C.S. Lewis finishes this, right? Listen up, Christians. It would be nice and fairly nearly true to say that from that time forth, Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could be very tiresome, but most of those I shall not notice. The cure had begun. Amen, Christians? There were still many days they could be very tiresome. (laughs) I won't ask for a show of hands. I think that's all of us, right? But the cure had begun. To be born again means to submit yourself to the holy, righteous, burning flame of God. But to be given new life in His name, free from strivings, and entirely given by the grace of God. That is the salvation that we are offered. And that's what Nicodemus had to surrender himself to. And that's what you and I have to surrender ourselves to. The grace of God. Let's pray. Lord, may it never grow tiresome for us. The amazing truth of John 3.16 Lord, that you so loved the world, you so loved us, that you sent your only son, Jesus. Lord, to die in our place, to pay the penalty of our sin, to live the life we can't, and then if we would put our faith in you, we would have life eternal in your name, given your righteousness. Lord, there is so much pride in the human heart that would rather strive than surrender to Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that they come to an end of pride and experience the sweetness of grace. Lord, likewise, it really comes from the same place. There's those who just want to walk in shame. They they cling to shame and guilt as a kind of comfort, Lord. I pray they would come to an end of that and trust in Christ alone. They'd let go of of those things, Lord, and experience the sweet, joyous freedom of grace. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity for life in Jesus, free from human striving. Lord, may that be the greatest treasure anyone here can ever cling to. Lord, we pray this in your precious name. Amen.